Understanding what's in this video will help you avoid being scroomed. Hello everyone, Dr. Chris Martinson here with another update for you. And this is an important one, this is a big one. You know I've been talking about COVID for a very, very long time. I talk about other things too in the world. This is really important. The reason I was able to get COVID so accurate and so right and was so far in front of so many giant August institutions such as the FDA, the CDC, the WHO, etc. is because, well, first I have a Comcast connection. But second of all, I'm not beholden by any special interests. I don't have any particular advertisers or conflicts of interest that are going to get in between me and my understanding of what's going on. That's superpower one. Number two is I'm the kind of person who will change their mind as soon as new data comes along. So those two things being nimble and not conflicted have really allowed me to be ahead of the pack. Now, I got to tell you that as bad as COVID has been, and most of that has been self-inflicted wounds, we can now say that, uh, that as bad as that's been, we're about to see something far worse coming along economically. I'm going to take you through that today. And first, let's go here. I'm calling this today, we have to call a spade a spade in this particular story. We're seeing a planned destruction of the middle classes and poor classes. I always like to say the old military saying that once is an accident, twice is a coincidence, but three times is enemy action. We're going to look at what is apparently clearly enemy action against the middle classes. And by the way, this is not a left-right polemic. I'm not going to be either on the left or the right. In fact, a pox on both their houses because both sides of the aisle have overseen the destruction of the middle class in the United States. They've been at the expense of war of the elite, team elite. Uh, these are billionaires. These are corporations. These are the powerful. These are people who are so, and corporations, entities that are so deeply enmeshed in the power structure that they frankly lost sight of where the wealth actually comes from in a nation. And the wealth of a nation always is in the general prosperity of all its people. It does no good to have a little tiny elite trying to protect their wealth against a lot of hungry hordes. That's called South America in some locations. It's called basically a third world country. So let's start here. No treatments for you was the first thing that I think got a lot of you onto my channel here was this idea that led by this man who's now in trouble apparently for the puppy experiments that have just been revealed that the NIH and NIAD were running. And by the way, you know you live in a dystopian paradise when uh, the ad that gets served up along with this headline is heart guard, protect your dog. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's where they go as a, from an advertiser standpoint, or maybe that's just bad ad placement. But um, it looks like more people are outraged by Anthony Fauci contributing to the death of a couple of dozen of beagle puppies, which is horrifying. But to me, not as horrifying as purposely, deliberately uh, throwing about 500,000 people under the bus uh, because of the no treatments for you paradigm, which saw... No advocation for vitamin D, for vitamin C, for vitamins, uh, getting zinc or selenium in there, uh, getting maybe quercetin or bromelain or other ionophore in there. These sorts of things we know, provably, scientifically, based on dozens of papers, would be treatments that would be actually very good at helping people prevent or limit the worst of COVID. In fact, if we had done that right from the outset, we probably would have discovered that we could have knocked COVID back to about the incidence of flu on a case fatality rate or an infection fatality rate ratio. But we didn't do that thanks to this guy. Biggest irony of all, if he gets chucked because of a few dozen puppies, um, actually, I think he has much deeper crimes to talk about and, and answer to, which he should do under oath at some point. What are in those emails, Anthony? January 29th to February 1st. We'd love to know what's in those emails. Um, so at any rate, this is uh, what I think caught a lot of people brought a lot of people to the point of understanding that the system was not caring about their health. The system does not care about your health. And by the way, I'm making this kind of U.S. focus, but it doesn't matter if you're in most of Europe or in Canada, especially, or in Australia or in New Zealand, you are under the grips of similar idea sets and agencies who really have your best health, your overall collective public health, not at the top of their priority scheme. It's about something else. Now, as bad as that is, as I mentioned, I still think there's something worse coming along. And what is that? That is a set of profound policy errors by an institution called your central bank. In the United States, that's the Federal Reserve. 
That could be the European Central Bank for most of Europe, could be the Bank of England for, for England, it could be Bank of Canada, obviously, Bank, People's Bank of China, et cetera. The central banks have made some extraordinary policy errors, and here it's appropriate for me to focus on the United States because the United States Federal Reserve really sets the tone. They are the leader of the pack. They are the, the top dog in this particular story. But let's bring this down to what is obviously overt corruption within the FD, sorry, within the Federal Reserve. This is a one Mr. Kaplan. He is president of the Dallas Fed, and I think he uh, succeeded uh, Mr. Fisher. Mr. Fisher was an honorable, awesome guy, still is. Uh, but Mr. Kaplan says here, quote in yellow, has been one of the Fed's strongest voices warning that high levels of monetary stimulus are boosting risk levels in the financial sector. Oh, he's warning people because we're pumping so much money in. We're boosting risk levels. What that means is everything has gone sky high because of the inflation the Federal Reserve has specifically torched off by pumping money into the system. So we have massive inflation. You're seeing it stake now, but before we've seen it in the Russell 2000 uh, stocks. We saw it in NASDAQ stock levels, the S&P, the Dow, worldwide stock levels, bond prices, real estate prices, fine art, Gulfstream 650s. Everything is exploding in price, particularly those higher end things. Why? Because inflation always goes where the money is. And when the Federal Reserve, under the tutelage of this guy and people like him, they pumped that money into the stock markets or into the financial markets more broadly. And the people who scooped that out, what do they like? Well, they like trophy properties and nice jets and super yachts, things like that. So Mr. Kaplan, he's on one hand, like all good economists, on the one hand, He's warning about excess high levels of monetary stimulus doing something, right? However, it now turns out that we discovered that Mr. Kaplan had a total of 27 individual stock fund or alternative asset holdings, each valued at over $1 million. Quote, the form that he had to submit here, quote, shows Mr. Kaplan made some combination of sales or purchases of over $1 million dollars in 22 individual company shares or investment funds during 2020, during the depths of the crisis when the Federal Reserve's own policies were designed to juice the markets, this guy thought, you know what? This would be a great time to make my own stock portfolio grow a lot more. Not enough to have uh, uh, 22 individual accounts, each with over a million bucks in it. Um, oh, he had 27, and he traded in 22 of them over a million bucks. So this guy was busy buying hand over fist to make more money for an already what you might say in a normal world, we would say, if he has more than a million dollars in 27 accounts, we can say he has a minimum of $27 million, but that's not enough. He needed more. And he was in a position where he could control directly the value of his own stock portfolios. By the way, in the bottom yellow part, quote, he worked for investment bank Goldman Sachs for more than two decades. Banker's going to bank, right? What do you got? What are you going to do? The level of ethics on display by Wall Street has always been uh, shoddy at best, uh, non-existent, or even <laughs> inversely correlated with what you would want it to be uh, over the long haul. So unbelievably obvious corruption coming out of this guy. But it wasn't just him. Uh, here's another Fed official who warned on real estate. Oh, no, real estate's doing going to be terrible in the maws of 2020. Um, this is uh, Kaplan. Another one. There was another, uh, several Fed officials got caught in this whole thing. So at any rate, they're just trading and they're trading for their own benefit. And uh, they are just absolutely doing something they should not be doing. So when you were in a high public uh, place, like for instance, a judge, a judge would never rule on a case which they have a direct interest in, right? They would have to recuse themselves for obvious reasons, right? You would never have a detective investigating a, a homicide that happened in his own family household, right? There are just certain things that we just know, of course, duh, you don't do that obvious no duh moment is the Federal Reserve officials should not have been trading their own accounts while they were actively steering policy to make the value of those accounts go up. That would have been a no-no. So uh, Powell leaping right to action here, getting my drawing tool out here. Look at him. He says, quote, no one is happy. Jay Powell told the press on September 22nd, 
No one on the FOMC is happy, that's the Federal Open Market Committee, is happy to be in this situation, to be having these questions raised. (laughs) He didn't say, I'm really sorry this happened on my watch. It shouldn't have happened. This was totally uh, my ball. You know what? I'll resign because this is an obvious flaw. This shouldn't have happened. Buck stops here. No, he said, quote, Nobody in his nobody at the FOMC is happy to be having these questions raised. He's just saying we don't like getting caught. <laughs> He's not saying we're sorry we did this. He's saying we don't like having to answer these questions. It's so proletariat. It's just so beneath us. I mean, I mean, we're the Fed. We shouldn't have to answer these questions, you grubby journalists and other humans out there. This is a disgusting statement right here. This is awful. This shows you the level of corruption is so deeply entrenched. That the this is a carefully worded statement. This isn't Jay off the cuff just going, let me make some words up. They sat down, they had some writers, you know, they got PR people and speech writers, and they thought these words out. And and the best he could say was, no one's happy, no one on the FMC is happy to be in this situation, to be having these questions raised. That's sad. That's just how deep the, 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 the corruption is so deep that he doesn't even feel like he has to come out with a, an apology of any sorts. The apology is that last part. It's something we take very, very seriously. Mm. Just like OJ. Very, very seriously looking for whoever killed Nicole. <laughs> come on, Jay. This is, but uh, anyway, all joking aside, the reason I'm bringing this up is because this shows you how endemic, how entrenched the corruption is that they don't even feel it's necessary to say anything other than we're really sorry somebody caught us at this we take that very very seriously that's how i interpret that uh so this is uh so let me just remind you i said this was the title of a slide that i put on march 4th 2020 when i saw that the federal reserve was riding to the rescue for these markets this is the exact same moment in time that these Fed officials were trading their own accounts. I saw this coming at the time, and I said it's destroying trust one intervention at a time because the Fed was intervening in the markets. But even I, at that time, seeing that that was coming, did not suspect for a moment that individual Fed officials, the senior leadership team, was busy trading for their own accounts. That is grubby and disrespectful, and it's beyond the pale. It totally is full stop, but it just shows how corrupt things have become in that institution. And, but down here, I love, uh, Yahoo finance and and Dow Jones and all these other places are always trying to sort of like soft pedal. And they say stock surge after democratic primaries. That's what they were saying in 2020. It's like, uh, (laughs) wasn't the democratic primaries. You want to know why stock surge? It was because right here, this is where the fed started printing billions and trillions of dollars. And right there, by the way, this is right at the exact moment that those Fed officials began trading their own stocks because they knew exactly how much they were throwing into the markets and they knew what the likely response was going to be. So this is why I just, I just, I do not like it when I have to read things like stock surge after Democratic primaries. Like there's some connection between those two things. Your poor brain's trying to fit them together. Stocks, Democratic primaries, Stocks care about primaries. Mm. <laughs> Just, anyway, it's nonsense. Uh, stock surged, a more honest headline, because the Fed threw trillions of dollars into the markets. And when you throw trillions of dollars into the markets, you know what happens. Remember, I told you, they didn't throw these into the markets. It's not like they threw them into your 401k account. That would be different. Be a different sort of an outcome. They didn't. They threw it into the coffers of the biggest Wall Street banks. They threw it into the coffers of big, big, big firms like Citadel, uh, BlackRock, et cetera, right? And so if you do that, and then you combine with official federal policy led by this guy here saying, no treatments for you. We have to mask up. We have to have social distancing. We have to have lockdowns. Those lockdowns, as you remember, didn't apply to everybody. It wasn't like we suddenly locked the whole country down for three weeks. Everybody stopped. Everybody went home. Everything stopped. No, there were these things called essential workers, right? Which included McDonald's and alcohol stores and Walmarts and Amazon, of course, that was completely essential. But small businesses run by middle-class people, those turn out to be non-essential more often than not. So what happens when you take trillions of dollars, throw it into the financial markets, close down small and medium-sized enterprises, what happens? 
Well, that's totally predictable, and I predicted it. So here's what happens. U.S. billionaires got 62% richer during the pandemic. Now, the pandemic was a a flat-out disaster economically for most people by the numbers. Statistically, the majority did not come out better. But the billionaires did. They got more billionaire 62% more billionaire And look, Leo Wade, who's on this list? Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, Bill Gates... Mark Zuckerberg, Larry Page, um, geez, Ellison from Oracle, uh, Sergey Brin, also from Google, Warren Buffett, a uh, bunch of Microsoft people here, Walmart people, Nike, Bloomberg, Amazon. Hmm. Hmm. I don't see a single small or medium-sized enterprise on that list. So what happened was all of these businesses made out like bandits, not only because they got more actual legit revenue from running their operations because they were the favored essential businesses that were allowed to remain open, but also because the Federal Reserve pushed money into the markets, which one step removed ended up in their pockets through rising stock prices. So that's what happened to the billionaires. What happened to the small and medium-sized enterprises, which are mostly dominated by people who earn a paycheck and or own a small and medium-sized business? That's the middle class. Nearly 100,000 establishments that temporarily shut down due to the pandemic are now out of business. Okay, this comes to us September 28th, 2020. Um, This has not gotten better over the last year. But to continue on a little deeper down in this article, but not all small businesses have been equally affected. According to a Federal Reserve Bank of New York report in August, the number of active black small business owners fell 41% February through April. February, March, April, three months, 41% of black owned businesses went kaput. So I can tell you now that on the basis of what the federal government combined with the Federal Reserve, which is not a federal organization, by the way, longer story about that, the federal government combined with the Federal Reserve in their twin policy sets, they crushed not just middle class people, but minorities specifically. So if you want to talk about a racist outcome, a racist organization, we need to talk about the Federal Reserve as an institution that systemically suppresses poor, middle class, and minorities. In other words, anybody not in the sphere of power, they crush. And by the way, all those same groups are getting more crushed by inflation today, which is a known outcome. When inflation hits, it doesn't hit everybody equally. It's a very regressive tax, as they say. It's regressive because it hits people who have lower incomes more than people who have a lot of income. If a steak goes from $10 a pound to $20 a pound, Jeff Bezos, not really going to notice. But if you're on the low end of the economic scale, you're going to notice. So that's what we mean by a regressive tax. So the Federal Reserve actively printing money to drive up financial asset prices, to make the billionaires even richer, to divide in a wealth gap, and to create inflation that will regressively hit the poor and the middle class is harder. It's a program. That's what I'm trying to bring to you. This isn't like an accidental thing. They talk about inflation as if it's we're ancient Romans and a comet just appeared. We have no idea. It's like, oh, inflation's appearing. It's such a predictable thing. I talked about it in the crash course in 2008. In fact, I talked about it at length. But here's the annoying part. This is what really gets, this is, I'm feeling a little spicy today. Maybe you can tell. I'm feeling a little spicy because this guy pisses me off. And you want to know why? Because he's allowed to come out here, like he said in May of 2021. He's talking about community development. This is the chair, Jerome Powell. That's this guy right here, whose own chief lieutenants, and probably he himself, were actively day trading their own grubby stock portfolios to get a few of those billions of dollars back into their hot little hands. All right, here's what he says to the public. Here he is speaking, um, and it's the 2021 Just Economy Conference, Just, a just economy. So they're talking about fair, and that's what just means here. So sponsored by the National Community Reinvestment Coalition in Washington, D.C. He says, good afternoon, pleasure to be with you today. Quote, together, over the last year, we, love the royal we, we, as if he's part, you know, we together, We have been making our way through a very difficult time. Not quite as difficult for Kaplan and the other guys, Rosengren, who've been trading their own stock portfolios. They're doing fine. But I mean, I mean, generally we, very difficult time. We are not out of the woods yet, but I am glad to say that we are now making real progress. 
Uh, While some countries are still suffering terribly in the grip of COVID-19, the economic outlook here in the United States has clearly brightened. Vaccination levels are rising. Fiscal and monetary policy are providing strong support. The economy is reopening, bringing stronger economic activity and job creation. By the way, this is he's he's writing this in um, May of 2021. Right. He or he knows he knows perfectly well that this has been the actual reality for everybody on Main Street. He knows it as well as anybody. He's got access to thousands of PhDs. Trust me. Jerome's got the goods. He knows what's happening. At any rate, he continues here, continuing, quote, here, quote, that is the high level perspective. Let's call it the 30,000 foot view. And from that vantage point, we see improvement. But we should also take a look at what is happening at street level. Hmm? Lives and livelihoods have been affected in ways that vary from person to person, family to family and community to community. No, Jerome, end quote. No, 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 no. It is hurt these people and it helped these people that's the story it's it's like he's trying to present like oh it varied a little you know there's some variance between this group and that group it varied somewhat uh you know if you can detect it it's a little bit of variance from these people to these people that's that's the story he's going with right all right uh the economic downturn has not fallen evenly in all americans he says and those least able to bear the burden have been hardest hit Notice that the sort of the, the deflective, passive tense verb usage here, the sort of the we, he's throwing us all in this. We have been all equally hit. We have shared in this, you know, these hard times. We, there's no we here, Jerome. It's not like we, the economic downturn has not fallen evenly on all Americans. It's, it's crushed the lower and middle classes. Accidental or by design? Well, let's carry on and see if we can... Uh, we can uh, do that. Here, here's how I think Jerome Powell sleeps at night. I, you can see I made him sort of peeking over the top like a creeper here, because this is a creepy sentence right here. This is from that same speech. Quote, achieving broadly shared prosperity will take action from across society, from fiscal and other government policy to private sector initiatives to the work everyone here does. The Fed can contribute as well. Using our monetary tools, policy tools, the Fed promotes maximum employment and price stability. <laughs> hey, I was talking about inflation. Uh, it was going to come a e- couple years back because you could just see it coming, right? Um, and here he's talking about price stability. And this is when inflation is already starting to skyrocket, right? Now it's, o- now it's obvious to everybody. We'll talk about that a little more, particularly in part two of this. But um, uh, <laughs> here he is saying... The Fed promotes maximum employment and price stability. No, no, no. It promotes a maximum wealth gap between these folks and these folks. That's what it actually promotes. And it couldn't be more obvious. It's in all the data. He doesn't even talk about it, though. But this is how he sleeps at night. This is his gruel thin veneer for his class serving a narrative. Um, And so at any rate. Fed promotes maximum employment and price stability, two foundations of a strong, stable economy that can improve economic outcomes for all Americans. We view maximum employment as a broad and inclusive goal. Those who have historically been left behind stand the best chance of prospering in a strong economy with plentiful job opportunities. That's not what happened. They printed money. They gave it preferentially to these billionaires. They knew that they were throwing all of these people under the bus, and the Federal Reserve has a strong, strong role in that. So that's the actual situation that we're in. I take this guy really annoys me because he pretends as if he's talking about these noble things, but they're all, they're not even noble lies. They're just flat out lies. So at this point, um, let me go on to this. So remember, uh, Jerome Powell kept talking about how in Inflation is going to be transitory, right? The transitory story is durable bullshit. Totally is. So here he is in June uh, saying the high inflation is temporary. It will wane. Mm, that, that sounds good. And then here uh, in uh, August, they're saying why the Fed's Powell still thinks high inflation is trans- or temporary in this case or transitory. That's August. But by September... Now we got, uh, this is from the Wall Street Journal, Fed officials see transitory inflation lasting quite a while. (laughs) You're supposed to, you got to make sense of that. Got to wrap your head around that. Transitory, which means temporary or fleeting in nature, soon to return to where it came from. Transitory, just transits across the situation. 
just a blip, is now going to be lasting quite a while. Um, that would be the opposite of that word. So that's the word salad you have to you have to put up with in these cases. All right. Why do I care? I care because this is actually a quote I put in my 2008 crash course because I could see all of this printing coming. It was I didn't know it was going to get this extreme, but I knew it was going to come. And the problem with the printing is it always, always, always throughout history, whether we were talking about coin debasement back in Roman times, whether we're talking about physical currency printing in the Weimar Germany time or Zimbabwe or Venezuela or now in the United States, it doesn't matter any time whether we're using fancy computers and big words or we're just debasing metal currency, it doesn't matter. The process always and everywhere benefits those closest to that printing press or coin debasement operation. That is, those in the position to gain that access to that money first win the most. That's always historically been true, which led to even Plutarch from thousands of years ago saying that, quote, an imbalance between rich and poor is the oldest and most fatal ailment of all republics, end quote. Now, why is it a fatal ailment? Well, because having a broad, stable economy with a broad, stable social structure is like a pyramid, a more stable pyramid than a really tall, narrow, skinny one with just a few wealthy people at the top and a lot of people beneath who are disadvantaged and unfairly disadvantaged. Because whether it's coin debasement in Roman times or the currency printing with the electronic digital printing press of liar, liar, pants on fire, Jerome Powell, it's the same process where the rich get richer, but not because they're smarter, not because they're better, not because they're more deserving, simply by virtue of the fact that they're closer to the printing press than everybody else. And what does that do? It creates that social breaking of the social contract. Like, oh, I got to pay my taxes and I should stop at this stop sign and I should be a good person because otherwise there'll be consequences. That's your part of the contract. But if they're not fulfilling their part of the contract, right? If Jeff Bezos is busy building giant yachts that cost $500 million and flying his magic penis into the sky and otherwise blowing billions of dollars, but he got most of that because the Fed just printed it out of thin air and gave it to him, thin air, uh, then it's not fair. We know that. We, we all know that. This The rich are getting ultra richer, not because of anything magic they've done, not because they're smarter, not because they are truly elites. They simply happen to be closer to the printing press than the rest of us, and that's unfair. And so it leads to this statement. I truly despise that the Federal Reserve is not monkeying around with monetary policy. They're monkeying around with our social contract. Nobody at the Fed went to school for social engineering. None of them have been through this program before. They're flying blind and doing it, but they should be doing it with knowledge, with humility, and with some semblance of grace and decorum. And because they're not, because they're doing stuff like this, I know for a fact they don't know what they're doing. They're, they're, they're just as caught up in grabbing the magic money while it's swirling around in the sky as, as anybody else in this story, which means they're not taking their job seriously. If this guy, if all the people of the Federal Reserve who are trading, day trading their own portfolios, enriching themselves, going to these nice parties at Davos, all the private jets flying in, talking about all these big world economic things, they would be more likely than not to hold a higher standard of ethics if they were doing it in an honest way. But they're not. Here we are, late stage corruption in an empire. This is kind of what it looks like at the end, as it's often been said. The last official act is to loot the treasury. So that's what it kind of feels like a little bit. And by the way, we're starting to see those warning signs all over the place. So this bothers me a lot. Now, based on this statement that an imbalance between the rich and the poor is a fatal ailment, this is the crime scene. This is the S&P 500. You can see down here, let me get my red circler out. This is where those Fed officials started to day trade their own portfolios because they knew the rest of this was coming. And by the way, just as a quick reminder, why do I call this a crime scene? Because of this. Remember uh, Bernie Madoff, uh, obvious Ponzi scheme? The guy was running an obvious Ponzi scheme for a decade. This hero... Harry Markopoulos was busy trying to warn the SEC. He was serving it up on a silver platter. He was sending the SEC spreadsheets showing that it was impossible for Bernie Madoff, using the strategy that he articulated in his, in his prospectus documents, to get the returns he was getting. It was a physical math impossibility, right? And so 
Markopoulos here and his team analyzed publicly available information, here quoting, about Madoff's network of feeder funds from offshore companies. The team pretended they wanted to invest in these funds. Markopoulos says he knew he was dealing with a fraud within minutes of examining the materials. Now, here's why this is important. He says here, quote, I read his strategy and it was so poorly put together, Markopoulos recalls, his strategy as depicted would have trouble beating a zero return and his performance chart went up at a 45 degree line. That line does not exist in finance. It only exists in geometry classes. Prima facie evidence of a financial fraud is when returns go up in a straight line. So let me help you out and bring back that Federal Reserve, sorry, the S&P uh, chart here from the lows of March of 2020 up through November of 2021. Notice anything about that line? By the way, if we wanted to put a compass on that, it looks to me like it's about a 30 degree straight line going from left to right. So who got richer during that? All that financial engineering. Well, you know, it was billionaires. And the Federal Reserve's sitting there going, oh, but we're all about maximum employment and price stability. Like, that's how they go to sleep at night. I'm a good person. I'm trying to do good things. I'm just trying to create maximum employment because that's the way most people get ahead. But in fact, when you engineer a straight line like this, it's a Ponzi scheme. And the people at the front of that Ponzi scheme can get fabulously wealthy. But by definition, everybody can't get rich during a Ponzi scheme. So, this looks like uh, evidence of fraud to me, and I deplore that this rule of straight, no pullbacks allowed, is just an absolute clear straight line from there to there. And that's what the Fed has engineered. And they did it, again, by pumping money in, and they've continued to pump this money, even though there's no real emergency, there's plenty of inflation, and the unemployment statistics have come way down. And some, those were the two criteria. They said, that's when we'll stop printing. Do you know why they're not stopping printing? They're not stopping printing because their precious straight line would start to fall, and they're very worried about what will happen if this begins to correct in any way, shape, or form. Hey, recently we had a tiny correction, and it was just money out the wazoo being printed and thrown in the markets by somebody. I'll let you work out who. So this line right here, this 30-degree angle, you know who that benefits. It benefits these folks more than anybody. It benefits the fact that the top 10% of the country owns about 89% of the stocks in the United States. So it's really benefiting one tiny demographic, but the Fed tells itself it's about maximum employment. Like it's trying to help everybody while it's actually enriching the same people that it goes to cocktail parties with and who it goes to events with and whose kids go to the same schools. That's just how it goes at the end of an empire. You get a very tiny disconnected set of elites who s exist in their own little bubbles to the point they don't even realize the words they are saying have nothing to do with the masses. They do not connect at all. So in other words, this little speech that we have Jerome Powell coming out with right here Sounds like nice, good gobbledygook, but let me decode, yet, decode that for you. That whole policy statement boils down to let them eat cake. That's, this, is our, this is our own Marie Antoinette moment. And by the way, he's smart enough to know what a bad job he's doing, and he knows the risks he's taking, and he knows that he's creating a future whose most likely outcome is actually a very damaging, damaging uh, collapse in the economy. So that bothers me a lot. And by the way... The same time that the Fed is busy pumping money into the pockets of these people right here, they come out of the woodwork every so often to lecture us. I loved this one because um, maybe you heard recently Janet Yellen said that maybe we're going to tax unrealized gains. I don't even know how that would work, but trust me, it's not going to apply to this crowd here. Somehow their unrealized gains will be double Dutch, offshore, Cayman Island, Panama Papers, you know, hidden and everybody else will have to be paying stuff. But look at this plan. You know, uh, Illinois got in a lot of trouble. They're in a lot of trouble. Their pensions are badly underfunded. So economists from the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, they, they put out a report, it's a report, um, suggesting a 1% statewide residential property tax on top of the property tax bills they already pay. The revenue from this new property tax would go entirely toward paying down the state's pension debt. So under the plan, home, owners of homes worth $250,000 would pay an additional $2,500 a year in property taxes for the next 30 years. So no treatments for you. That's it. Fauci's version. Jerome Powell's version or the Fed's version is no printing for you. But they'll print for other people. And I guarantee you, we know that, that the people in, at the upper echelons of power, they got treatments for their COVID.
just wasn't treatments for you. We know that the Federal Reserve will print trillions of dollars to hand to their closest buddies in Wall Street, but well, we're going to have to ask the homeowners to pay a lot more to just cover the, the debts that they owe, right? So it's no printing, no printing for you. By the way, I did mention it. This is uh, Jerome, pa uh, sorry, uh, Jeff Bezos' uh, $500 million yacht. But don't worry, people, it's going to have some sales on it. So it's going to be, I'm sure, very, very, very uh, carbon friendly because it's going to have sales on it in addition to a 300,000 horsepower engine or whatever he's going to put in that thing. By the way, this is what Jeff Bezos is doing, right? This is what he's doing. Similar to no treatments for you, if you Google this term, climate change, what can I do? Well, the first thing they're going to tell you is you got to save energy at home, you know, LED, maybe light bulbs or maybe do laundry in cold water or hanging things to dry <laughs> instead of using a dryer. Hey, maybe you should take a bike to work. Maybe eat more veggies, eat more veggies. That's what you can do. And this is going to be marketed heavily in the years to come that you have a lot of personal individual responsibility for climate change. You will not read a single article about the climate impact of this or potentially this, which is Bill Gates. Hey, he's busy telling, he, you know, he, there's a crazy plan where Bill Gates is like flying high stratospheric balloons around to put like sparkly layers in the upper stratosphere to bounce the sun off, you know, to reduce climate change is the story. And But he's also busy buying $4.7 billion private jet companies um, because, well, I have to ask, how many cold showers would I have to take to offset one private jet trip? I bet it's a lifetime. <laughs> And so uh, anyway, it's just I'm just you know where I'm going at with this. Right. So the title of this whole thing was it's the purposeful destruction of the middle class. The rich and the elites get away with whatever they want to get away with. They print up money. They hand it to themselves. They get the best treatments. You don't get any of that. And you're going to be asked to take cold showers so that these people can continue to fly in their private jets. That's just where this is going at this particular state. And by the way, it's not just I just picked on one guy, Bezos. But and by the way, Bezos is uh, Washington Post will be very happy to tell you all the ways you can personally <laughs> take cold showers and eat crickets so that you can help climate change. At any rate, uh, how many cold showers would have to would have to take to offset one nautical mile in this behemoth? And by the way, super yacht brokerage sales up a record-breaking 46% in the first three months of 2021. It's just been a banner year. Uh, super yacht, I believe, is over. It's like over 27 meters or something, or I forget. It's kind of big. Anyway, a thing that looks like that. Um, and by the way, I think this is made by the same company that makes, uh, is making the Bezos uh, yacht. Really beautiful things uh, off the charts. But it all boils down to a set of things, less for you. So way back here in 2014, I mean, check this out. Way back in 2014, I missed it back then when it was coming out because it was sort of under the, under the radar. But the United Nations University, whatever that is, uh, was saying eating less meat is essential to curb climate change, says report. I bet that same report doesn't say anything about how essential it is to have less record-breaking super yacht sales. I'm going to bet that report doesn't say anything about this, but that's just a guess. I haven't actually read the report. But back in 2014, already they were starting to float the idea that your diet is um, it's kind of killing the world, right? And uh, it's, oh, hey, the Atlantic has one just about that. Your diet is cooking the planet. And that just came out in April of 2021. So I'm just giving you the sweep here. This is a constant sort of a theme, which is you are responsible individually for everything that's going on. And that may be true, but I have to confess, one person or even a whole city of people eating a slightly better diet or even a much better diet for the climate is not going to offset a week of this thing tooling around in the Adriatic. It's just just how it is. The, the amount of diesel that thing burns. I'm going to guess, if I had to guess, three or four gallons per mile would be my guess. Um, but I don't know. Maybe it's a super efficient ship. At any rate, uh, the ultra-rich Americans, they now own an average of nine homes. But this was back in 2016 before the Fed made the billionaires more billionary. So maybe that's up even more. And more than half of these vacation homes are located in the Americas, which includes um, North and South America. So less for you just means more for them. That's the sweep of the story I'm telling you. And, and so when you hear about the Federal Reserve as an organization that is ostensibly trying to help you, that is not the case. There's no data or actions to support that idea. We have tons of data to suggest that the Federal Reserve is busy destroying your life. And you will notice this when you go to stores and you see super high prices for things 
And you're going to notice this um, when you uh, attempt to buy a home as a new time first, you know, young home buyer, and you see that they're way out of your your price uh, stratosphere. You're going to know this when you're paying super premium prices for stocks that you would want to tuck as a young person into a long-term portfolio, but buying at super elevated prices is not a great way ever to get wealthy in this story. And they're printing, 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 and they're not going to stop until something breaks. And that is really the subject of part two of this at peak prosperity is what does that break look like? So what does systemic corruption actually mean to you? Well, Aaron Morgenstern put it well and said, all empires fall eventually. It is the way of things. And we would note that they kind of have a similar theme when they do fail. The decline of the Ottoman Empire was pegged pretty heavily to corruption and nepotism. So that led to their downfall. And, of course, the Roman Empire, as corruption was shot through right at the end. The Roman Empire lasted a really long time. Then it had a few hundred years of high-end corruption and just tanked. There was no other reason for it. Uh, except for really just uh, running out of steam and and they lost the plot line of why they were all in it together. And once the corruption decides there's a them and an us and the us wants to have more and they can never have enough because they're stuck in their egos and the ego always wants more, so it always gets more, nothing is ever enough for a big ego, right? That's That's what this and this are all about, the planes and the boats. It's all about the ego not having enough. So... Supply chain disruptions and systemic corruption. We see here systemic corruption, I've now articulated, exists at the CDC, at the FDA, that's the Federal Reserve on the lower left, proceeding over one more counterclockwise. That is the NIH, of course, the American Pharmacists Association, oof, doing awful things these days, and of course, mainstream media. A lot of systemic corruption, it's just these organizations are so shot through with it that they don't really know up from down. All they know is their own, you know, Greed and avarice are their axes at this point in time. So I'm going to be talking about that more and more. And by the way, this whole supply chain thing, this is something I first started talking about in earnest March 5th, 2020, 2020 update. I was talking about the growing impact of what's going to happen with um, the supply chain disruptions that were happening around precursor chemicals, shutdowns in China, shutdowns in India. That is what's hitting us today, right now, is actually those shutdowns and disruptions that started back then. And now, for a myriad of reasons, those of like a pig and a python have finally come through the snake, and we're dealing with them now. So what are we talking about at Peak Prosperity right now? Well, first, the WF and their diabolical reshaping of the world. It's a guest article by Phil Deniston. It's a great article. We're talking down here. We're having a webinar this week where we're going to be talking about planning for this dark winter called a difficult winter here. But um, this is an opportunity for you if you want to ask me questions live. And Evie will be there. We'll have my whole team And we'll be talking about stuff behind uh, the Peak Prosperity Paywall because that's where we get to be a little bit more free with our conversation. And as well, don't forget, we have these incredible market updates here by Dave Fairtex. And this they're always really worth uh, one of my favorite write-ups out there. They're fantastic. uh, So those come out weekly. Check those out if you want as well. So for today, my conclusions. My conclusions and summary for today are first, major U.S. and EU institutions have become corrupted. And corruption leads to downfalls. I think we're too far over the tips of our skis. That's why I want people to become resilient. Greed and personal gain are now driving the ship of state. And that kind of means that uh, it's effectively rudderless, that ship of state. It's drifting towards danger. Next, I believe the Federal Reserve serves the ultra-rich alone and literally does not care about you or your future at all. That's what their actions. The words say something else, but I trust actions more than words. The actions of the Federal Reserve say they don't care about us. They don't actually care about uh, the the majority of the population. We know the NIH does not care about promoting health. They care about selling more drugs. We saw that in how they promoted remdesivir on the basis of shoddy data and how they've suppressed every single treatment that was off patent. They couldn't have cared less. They denigrated it. They squished it. They ran anti, uh, anti-campaigns anti against it. Um, Jeffrey Epstein did not kill himself. I don't know how that snuck in there. I, I'm not responsible for that. That just, I'll have to talk to my copy editor about that one. The FDA does not care about your health. That's true. We, we, they, they've proven that over and over and over again. Fauci lied. People died. And puppies We know that. He's very much, I think that's a litmus test. How you feel about Fauci tells a lot about where you are in this story. If you think he's a saint, 
yeah, you probably didn't make it this far to the video, so I'm not talking to you. <laughs> For those of us who are paying attention, we understand that this guy's kind of at the center of it all in terms of the corruption, at least around the COVID side. But if the Fed's at the center of their own form of corruption and on and on and on. All right. The plan or or an impossible string of coincidences serve to enrich the rich and eviscerate the lower and middle classes. Again, it's an impossible string of coincidences. And by the way, I happen to believe that smart people plan and they plan to win. And so we've just seen the largest big corporations winning. And that's because both parties were in on it. It's nothing about left or right. It's about the fact that we're at that late stage corruption that defines the fall of an empire, which is something I think you need to be ready for. In short, there is a massive wealth transfer underway, something I've been warning about for many, many years. It's completely understandable. Watch the crash course. It'll explain what wealth really is and why a wealth transfer is kind of one of the last official acts. But please don't confuse currency with wealth. It's a marker, a chit, a social arrangement. Real wealth is primary and secondary wealth. Land, rich ore, timber, means of production, things like that. That's real wealth. Everything else is just a claim. All right. uh, And that means that the rehearsal is over. And that's the subject of part two that I'm going to talk about here. And let me just show you what that's going to be about. Um, Over at Peak Prosperity Part 2, we're going to talk about how supply chain disruptions combine with this systemic corruption, how those two pieces come together and that the systemic corruption is the thing that is going to unhinge us because we, we just won't be able to get out of our own way on this. So what we're talking about is that you need to understand the larger system of what's happening here and how that larger system is going to prevent us, this is the collective us, from making better decisions. I think the the rule of corruption is the corrupt remain corrupt. They continue to do what they're going to do. They behave how they're going to behave. The problem is we need to be working together. We need unity. We need our best and our brightest fearlessly leading us. And instead we have grubby politicians and bureaucrats enriching themselves and lining their own pockets. And that's just not a formula for success, especially when things get dicey. Things are getting very dicey. There's a dark winter coming for Europe. There's supply chain disruptions that could easily lead and are going to, and I would predict are going to lead to more economic pain going forward. We'll just have to see how bad it is. So that's what we're talking about there. Come on over. Love to see you there. That's all I have for you today. I know that was a lot, but hey, you deserve it. All right. We'll see you next time.